Welcome to Philosophy and Faith, where our goal is to help you navigate your intellectual and spiritual journey, especially in regards to topics like God, faith and doubt, meaning and purpose, and more. I'm Nathan Beeson. And I'm Daniel Jepson. And together we discuss the big questions that humans have wrestled with for thousands of years. We're glad you can join us. So today we're going to be talking about the philosophical category called anthropology, which is a really big fancy word for the, the category that explores the nature of humans, humanity, questions like what sets humans apart from other animals or of course, it's interesting. If you pick up a philosophy textbook, you probably won't have a chapter labeled anthropology. Really? Uh, yeah. And anthropology is a term and a category I like to use because this is at the place where at least two of those other large divisions intersect. And that would be the categories of metaphysics as well as the categories of value theory. And then it also affects epistemology. Yeah, this, this to me seems like a deeply important question because it feels a little bit less ethereal to me and more grounded because, you know, we're people. Mm -hmm. And so do people matter? Are people important? Are they different? Right. What's the value? Especially, I think a lot of the political questions that we have related to economy or related to just the treatment of the unborn, or a lot of these are probably grounded in anthropology. Is that fair? Yes, it is. And even more than that, though, I think one of the reasons that this hits home for me or that I want to talk about it is because I feel like people don't have an understanding of their purpose as humans. I think there is an answer to that, but I think most people either don't think about their purpose for being here or conclude they don't have a purpose for being here or they're just a little confused about the whole thing. Yeah, this uh, one is more kind of personal perhaps. I think so. Yeah, we're going to be talking about what makes humans unique and then related to that, what makes them valuable? And that will give the foundation for finding purpose, purpose for humanity, but also more importantly for our individual purpose. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I can see how it's kind of in between metaphysics and value theory. Right. And that's why I'm using the term anthropology, even though I'm risking having the thought confused with physical anthropology, which studies human origins and societies. So we're going to look at, again, at the four broad categories, the families, so to speak, the four big worldviews. And of course, these are a little bit generalized for the sake right. of not having a five hour long podcast. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we're, we're flying at 40,000 foot level here. This is an overview. So each of these is really a family of worldviews underneath that or, or different ways of looking at this world. Yeah, it's kind of like we mentioned last time in biology, you have the species, which would be Homo sapiens. Then you have the genus, which would be primates, and then the larger family, which would be mammals. So we're looking at this larger families of ideas. Yeah, that makes sense. So we've got monotheism, we've got atheism, we've got pantheism, and we've got polytheism. So right. what do you say we get into each of these, exploring kind of the, the perspective on each of these four big worldviews and their relationship to the uniqueness and the value of humanity? Yeah, let's do it. Cool. All right, let's do monotheism first. So what, what would you say is the anthropology of monotheism? The basic fundamental idea or truth about anthropology within this monotheistic perspective is that humans are created and they're created with a purpose and a value inherently. So a Christian and a Jew will believe that there is a God who transcends this universe and that at a certain time, to use that word loosely, he brought forth within this world certain beings and one race or species of that being Homo sapiens, and that they have a unique value because they alone are created in God's image to be God's likeness within this world. So that is a fundamentally important distinction that is not true of the other worldviews that we're going to be looking at. So in this viewpoint, humans are unique because they have a unique place and role within this world and a unique potential for a relationship with the Creator. And humans are valuable because God has given us that valuable role and purpose in place right from the start. So it's an inherent thing. Value is a gift that you were given. It's something inherent about you simply by virtue of being a human. It's not something you achieve. And because of that, your value is not dependent on what you do, or how smart you are, how beautiful you are. The ugliest person in the world is just as valuable as the most beautiful supermodel. A person with Down syndrome, 
is just as valuable as the next Einstein. It's not based on any of those criteria. Gotcha. Yeah, that's really interesting. So it's not performance or function based as much as just, like you said, it's inherent. Yes. Okay. You want to start talking about the next one here? Sure. So the next one you would call secular thought, or you could call it materialism or naturalism here because we're lining them all up according to their most basic belief about the nature of reality in terms of a God. We're calling it atheism. Naturalism is a better name for the worldview, the idea that reality is matter and energy only. So nature as opposed to supernatural. And again, this is the basic idea. There are no gods of any kind. There's nothing that transcends this cosmos that we're in, however you want to define it. And remember last time we talked about having a small terrarium in your hands. And the question is, is there anything outside the terrarium, anything outside the box? And monotheism, Christianity, Judaism, Islam say yes, that the box is not eternal, that there was a time or place when it was brought into being by our person. But secular thought doesn't have that answer because they don't believe in a personal God outside of the universe. Now, if that's the case, then a couple things happen. First of all, you have a different ultimate reality. For example, you brought that terrarium into existence. And in this case, like creation ex nihilo, you did not do that from pre-existing materials, but you were able to create both the materials and the form of that. Now, in that scenario, you have kind of two realities, right? You have you and the things that you have made. Yeah. Which one's more ultimate? Me. Yeah, because you can exist without that. Yeah. You can't exist without you. There's a contingency. It depends upon you. It's not as ultimate. And one day, conceivably, you could do away with it if you chose to. Yeah. So in that scenario, the ultimate reality is personal, rational, and purposeful. But if the box is the only thing that there is... If there is nothing that transcends the cosmos, then you don't have that answer. Somehow, in this scenario, that matter became formed into the structure of the universe that we know now. And at some point in time, some of that matter, and we're using matter in the most generic sense, so whatever you call the stuff of the universe apart from God or the supernatural realm. Okay, so somehow that matter formed into living beings. Now, I, I hear sometimes our atheist friends tell us that they don't accept anything without evidence. I don't think that's true, because everyone that I have met has believed that life arose from non-living matter. Why? Well, because they don't believe in any sort of creation, whether it's guided evolution or creation instantaneously. By necessity, they believe that it had to work. It's the only option you, you really have. Somehow, matter arose from non-living matter. There is no purpose because there is no purpose there. It just happened. And of course, you can't prove that life could come from non-life. We have never seen it happen. In fact, one of the fundamental principles of biology is biogenesis, that life always comes from pre-existing life. That's always the way it has worked. Every time we have seen life arise, it has been following that principle. But if you believe that there is no living thing outside the cosmos, and yet we are alive, you have to believe that. But think about what that means then for the uniqueness and the value of the living things. There's no purpose there, so there's no purpose. There's no end in mind. It simply came to be either by blind chance or the necessity of pre-existing conditions, but not by purpose. Therefore, what are humans? They're just the product of some natural process. Right. I guess. <laughs> How would you say it? Under this viewpoint, what's usually upheld, and really the only thing I've really seen upheld consistently, is this idea that humans in their present form exist and are formed by the laws of natural selection alone. So we're not just talking about evolution versus creation. You can be a Christian and believe in evolution. You would just believe that God guided that process and that he made sure that it attained certain ends. But you don't have that option if there is no God. All you have is unguided natural selection. So how are the organisms of this world formed? Only because certain mutations gave certain members of that species an advantage when it came to reproductive fitness, which usually also implies getting more food and resources. 
You get more food and resources, you're probably going to reproduce more. So chance mutation that occurred that helped your subset of that species get more food or resources is going to naturally be selected as occurring more often in the next generation until eventually that whole species changes and is modified into something slightly different because of that. So the mechanism involved is simply natural selection alone. That's the only game in town. Now, in that case, then what happens is that humans have evolved only by that process. And humans do not necessarily have any inherent value. So can I hop in? Perhaps a theist would say that we were created versus somebody coming from a secular perspective would say we're not created. We're not created beings. There's not any intentional creation from a transcendent being. The the next question then is the, the process of how humans became humans either through a guided process from theist perspective versus not a guided process, natural selection. And so from the the theist perspective, then because there's, there's creation from a creator with a process that's somehow guided, there is an inherent purpose and value. But from the secular perspective, there's no intentional creation. The process is natural selection. So there's really not any inherent, inherent, value or purpose, maybe beyond uh, continuing on the natural selection process. Is that fair? Yeah, for the most part, I think it is. And again, we could ask, why is it important for us to carry on the reproductive process? I guess the the, the answer, I don't know, I haven't thought through. I mean, just because that's that's what we're a part of and that's what we're supposed to do. (laughs) Yeah, we could say that. I'm not sure how intellectually satisfying that answer is. Yeah. Or, or why our species, we should seek for the good of that as opposed to other species like cockroaches or mosquitoes. They are the result of the same process. So we've been talking a little bit about kind of the, the origins and, and that kind of thing, but what then what would separate humans from the cockroaches or the mosquitoes? The usual answer that I have seen from naturalists is primarily two things. One, we are conscious of ourselves in a way that the other species are not. And then second, we have a higher degree of function. We are more intelligent. We can do more things because of that intelligence. So we function at a greater level. We're more organized in our thought process, more creative in our thought process. We can do these things that other species can't. Gotcha. How, how, would, the, how would the Christian or the monotheist answer that question they would say that we are able to do those things because we're made in a distinct way through a distinct process and purpose gotcha. the problem with stating that our value is dependent on those things and not an inherent gift well there's a couple problems with it first of all you have a hard time stating which species have self-awareness Maybe cockroaches don't, but what about the higher mammals? So it's, it doesn't seem to be clear cut and dried in that sense. The other problem with self-consciousness as a criteria is why is that more valuable than, than not? That's something we value because we have that, but that doesn't mean it's inherently valuable. And again, the problem with arguing for our value based upon our functionality, our intelligence, creativity, transmission of culture, the things we're able to do because of our intelligence is because, number one, why should that inherently be more valuable? And number two, what you have then is you have a value system that puts certain people, high-functioning people, as more valuable by your criteria than those who are less intelligent. Let me give you an example of that. In 1993, a philosopher named Peter Singer made the statement that no newborn should be considered a person until 30 days after birth and that the attending physician should kill some disabled babies on the spot. Now, we might think that's a crazy, radical idea that no one else would hold or sanction or accept. But in fact, five years later, he was appointed as professor of bioethics at Princeton. Really? So how did did he arrive at this this conclusion? Well, he he wrote this in 1979. Human babies are not born self-aware or capable of grasping that they exist over time. They are not persons. Therefore, quote, life of a newborn is of less value than the life of a pig, a dog, or a chimpanzee. So personhood is based on self-awareness. Yes. And so... And intelligence. And intelligence. And so those animals that have more self-awareness than an infant are inherently more value 
Yes. That's that's interesting. Right. And I think we can see the problem with that, hopefully. <laughs> it's also really interesting that the, the way, that, I mean, this is, we've kind of been talking a lot about how all these are interconnected. Yes. So how you think about yes. humanity and anthropology is going to affect your ethics. And that's very clear that the ethical tip of the iceberg here has a lot of stuff beneath it uh, related to anthropology and metaphysics and that kind of thing. Right. Let me give you one more quote by Bertrand Russell, who was a very famous philosopher and atheist of the previous century. He writes that man is the product of causes which had no prevision of the end that they were achieving, and that his origin, his growth, his hopes and fears, his love and his beliefs are but the outcome of accidental collocations of atoms, and that no fire, no heroism, no intensity of thought and feeling can preserve an individual life beyond the grave, and that all the labor of the ages, all the devotion, all the inspiration, all the noonday brightness of the human genius are destined to extinction in the vast death of the solar system, and that the whole temple of man's achievement must inevitably be buried beneath the debris of a universe in ruins. All these things, if not quite beyond dispute, are yet so nearly certain that no philosophy which rejects them can hope to stand. Only within the scaffolding of these truths, only on the firm foundation of unyielding despair, can the soul's habitation henceforth be safely built. What's he saying there? Well, he's saying you have to just come to, to realize the fact that if there is no God, then mankind is here pretty much by accident, and that all that he does and achieves is not going to outlive a certain amount of time period. And so we have to live in light of those realities that he believes anyway. And what's what's the, what does he say is the emotional response to that? That last sentence you yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Only within the scaffolding of these truths, only on the firm foundation of unyielding despair, can the soul's habitation henceforth be safely built. That's so interesting. Right. And I think he was more open and consistent than a lot of our naturalistic brothers and sisters. Like Nietzsche, he was able to see that the denial of God or the death of God, as he put it, has serious consequences for how we view mankind. And a lot of people either haven't gotten the memo or they don't want to read it. And that's so interesting because, I mean, Peter Singer and Bertrand Russell are heavy hitters. Yeah, I mean, this is not taking the, the guy down the street. These are these are really well respected philosophers coming sure. from this atheistic perspective. They just, like you said, they can connect the dots. But that's that's just fascinating. The, the, the talk of despair that comes as a as a logically flowing conclusion to denying the existence of God. Exactly. Cool. So we've we've spent a lot of time on what we've called monotheism and what we've called secularism. Now, there are two other big families, sure. worldviews. There's <laughs> what, what we're calling e Eastern thought or pantheism, and then there's paganism or called polytheism. I'd love to hear you reflect on the anthropology. You get to choose which one you want to talk about first, though. Well, let's talk about Eastern thought. And, and here, I'm primarily thinking of classical Hindu thought because that, I think, is the most influential of all the others. Not everyone in the East is going to hold these viewpoints. Sure. But Hinduism is a huge popular religion, and it has developed a certain coherence of its ideas in a very impressive way sometimes. In Hinduism, in this type of Eastern thought, when you talk about mankind, you have to distinguish very carefully between what you call the Atman, and then the particular person or form or animal that you have to be at the time. So the idea is that there is a living essence called an Atma that pervades all living things, and at various times it will assume different forms, like you, like your wife, like your child, but also like your, your pets or pretty much any mammal or other animals that you can think of. And the analogy that's, that's used uh, one of their sacred writings is that just as a person wears clothes for a certain while and then takes them off and changes them, 
so this life force takes on your form for a while and then discards that, changes it into a different life form. So it's a very sharp dualism between your physical state right now and this inner Atman within you, this living force. Your body's going to die, but this Atman is simply going to take another form. So I've grown up in the West, so this is very new yeah. um, to me. Is it kind of like a soul or a spirit, kind of in Western terms? It is, but less personal. So from what I understand, anyway, they would not view the Atman as personally distinct and having personal will, volition, and values. It's more, I don't want to say in personal life force, but it's more that than what we would say is a soul of a person or a spirit of a person. Related to that, there's also the belief that Atman is Brahman. The idea that there's not really a distinction between the Atman that is within you, this living force, and this ultimate one oneness. So that's the idea that inside of you, there is this spiritual force that is also identical in some ways to the spiritual life force of the entire universe. Your present life is just one manifestation of that force taking on a physical form, just like you would put on certain clothes for a day. And then that's done away with, and it picks up another set of clothes or another physical uh, manifestation of who it is. Gotcha. To help us understand this, can you give us a refresher? Because I feel like it's pertinent on the metaphysics and especially the idea of monism. Right. So monism simply means the idea that all is one. That reality is not two things or multiple divisible things. Reality is all one thing. And in Eastern thought, the divisions that we see in the world, the divisions between you and I, between you and other things, is actually maya. The word they use, best way to translate that, I believe, would be in illusion. So your goal here, and, and this is pertinent to anthropology because we're going to talk about your purpose or goal, but your goal of your life is to go further in understanding these truths, to find enlightenment, enlightenment being defined as a knowledge of this in the deepest way possible. Thank you. So then maybe the question, the other question we talk about, human uniqueness and human value. So it sounds to me like if we are all God, not in the sense that we're all gods, but there's a, a monism, that all is one, then there's a high value to human life. You would think that. But when Western people really started engaging with the cultures of the East, in particular India, they couldn't help concluding that they felt life was cheap there. Really? And I think we can follow the logic of this. So, in again, in Western monotheistic religions, human life is unique and valuable because it alone is a manifestation of the partnership of God within this world, right? But that's not true in Hinduism. In Hinduism, there is no clear-cut distinction between humans and other types of, of life, in particular the higher mammals. A human is more aware of these truths than an animal. An enlightened human and humans of higher castes have that to a greater degree. And a caste is something you're born into, just like you're born into species of living things. So what happens then, you think, okay, that elevates all living things. And that's why Hindus are primarily vegetarian. And they all avoid eating beef because they view cows especially as having great spiritual significance yeah if you believe that all life or all mammals or all living beings that you could eat at least all are somewhere on the same spectrum they all have the same spirit of atman within them they're just manifestations of it at a time just like we are well that elevates them but at the same time it levels humanity to be in the same thing as them in uh -huh. terms of their value and and uniqueness or at least that seems to be the tendency to some degree. That's really fascinating. Yeah. And again, I'm, I'm oversimplifying because we've just got a few minutes here. But that is the conclusion that people who began to study the value of human life, that was the conclusion they came to. 
that yeah, that's helpful. And of course, a lot of variants in Eastern thought and pantheism. You know, you're talking a lot about Hinduism because it influenced a lot of the others. But in that category, we've got Buddhism and Taoism, and even more recently showing up in the West, this New Age philosophy. Right. And I should hasten to say that Hinduism has divisions in this thought, just like other religions do. So not every Hindu even would believe what I just said, but that seems to be the the classical teaching of the mainstream texts. Yeah. And that's good. There's a lot of variance in belief in all these, even even in even in the species of Christianity. Sure. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's it's not our goal to oversimplify in order to straw man. It's we're oversimplifying out of necessity here because time is limited and <laughs> Right, because we're we're trying to understand these as philosophies. Yeah. And their most basic element, not simply what individuals or groups within that do or think. Yeah. And because of that, we're looking at the very broad picture. Cool. So just a few minutes left. Paganism, which again is not pejorative, but just the idea that maybe there are lots of gods, but that they're not transcendent. And of course, our examples of this, a, a lot of these ancient religions like the Greek thought with the pantheon and the Norse gods and the Egyptian gods. And all, all, these are all examples of paganism. Will you share a little bit about in general terms? Sure. What's the perspective of humanity from this polytheistic kind of paganistic perspective? Right. And again, paganism is simply a, a term that originally meant someone from the rural areas, something like the Romans use that term to distinguish them from themselves who were moving into a, a little bit more sophisticated worldview and philosophy. So polytheism is associated with this, the, the belief that there's a multitude of gods within the universe. Where does that leave humanity? Paganism, I don't think, gives a very clear answer to that about the value or the uniqueness of human. You have all kinds of different myths. You have the myths of man's creation by the gods in, and of course, Greece, we're a little bit familiar with that. All the other paganistic societies, whether in Canaan or Babylon, they also had myths that kind of told the story of how mankind got created. And very often, in the older religions especially, mankind was created to serve the gods. And it seems like in the earliest stages, they believed this was quite literal, that when you were bringing food to the temple, you were actually feeding the gods in a physical way. Hmm. Of course, that uh, belief would be various over time, but there wasn't a consistent answer, at least I don't think there's a consistent answer to what makes humans unique and valuable. There's a lot of a lot of variants yeah, in all of these, but especially this one, it sounds like. Yeah, I would, be, I would be curious learning more about, especially some of these that are showing up more in the the West, like Wicca, I would be curious if somebody wants to leave a comment, maybe they have some insight on to, into the anthropology, that particular religion. Yeah. Be interesting. I would too. Well, thank you so much. Is there anything else that you, you want to share before we close up here? Yeah, let's go back in light of all this and come back to human uniqueness and value according to monotheistic religion, and in particular Christianity, because that's what I'm to be most familiar with. What makes us unique? Again, we are created in the image of God. We are created, I think the best way to phrase that, as the image of God. That word image is a word that you would normally use for idols in other places in Scripture. The physical manifestation of an invisible person within this world. In a sense, that's what we humans are. We are made in God's likeness. So we have, not physically, because God does not have a body. He's not made of matter. He made matter. So we are like God, not physically, but in the sense that we function like him and have certain characteristics like him. Rational thought, free will, purposeful planning, abstract communication, deep emotions. We are like him in that way so that within this world, we can has his partners and his image. When I come to the question of what makes humans unique, I thought about this for a long time, many, many decades. I used to think it was one certain characteristic, you know, we could use tools, we could use language. Those are all clues to something I think that's, that's much deeper. 
I think we as humans live in a fundamentally different way in relationship to this world than every other species. Hmm. I think fundamentally, when you think of it this way, there's more difference between us and a chimpanzee than there is between a chimpanzee and a snail. Say, say more. Well, other species, for the most part, take this world as it is. And what I mean by that is they respond to the world in terms of their needs and desires, but they do not conceptualize a world that is not here, but one that could be here. Hmm. They don't conceptualize a reality that they would regard as favorable, better, more just, more beautiful, and then work towards that using shared communication and abstract reasoning that we do, Hmm. or we should. Yeah. That's our function. There are obviously some animals who change their environments. You know, birds build nests. That's changing your environment. Beavers build dams. But that seems to be instinctual in them. It's not in the sense of purposeful. They're all going to do the same thing pretty much in the same way, given the similar environments. That seems to be just hardwired into their instinct. Whereas with us, we're not just problem solving. We are conceptualizing something that's not here, but could be here. And whether that's a house or whether that's a just society, we do that in a way that no other species does. That's super fascinating. That's what I think is the heart of human uniqueness and therefore along with that human value. Wow. And that seems to go all the way back to Genesis 1. It does. Genesis 1 is a profound philosophical text, at least in my opinion. Yeah. God puts Adam and Eve in the garden and says, care for it. Right. Expand it. Make yeah. it beautiful. Produce the fruit. You know? Exactly. There's, a, there's an innate purpose given by God, spoken over humans and to humans by a loving, creative God that they participate in his creative work and so he's given them that vision to realize what he started in the beginning and then it's interesting that in the, in the end of scriptures in revelation you see the fulfillment of that there's again the garden scene mm-hmm. the humans fulfilling their purpose of cultivating the garden yeah and i'm glad you brought that out isn't it interesting that right after this creation and, and commission of mankind there are farmers they're gardeners i've had the privilege of moving into houses that had nothing in terms of garden or landscaping at all in the back. In both cases, it was either just bare grass, no trees, no bushes, no flowers, or it was just a patch of weeds. And I was able to conceptualize in my mind and even on paper a different reality. And I was able to partner with the one who I believe made the earth and made the soil and made the potentiality in the seeds that I would plant. I was able to partner with that person in making that a fundamentally different place than it was before. I believe that's a metaphor for our purpose in life in general, that we are to see not only what is and respond to it according to our desires, but what could be, what should be, and work according to what gifts we have to make that happen. I believe that's our purpose. And each person has to figure out in their own life how that works out, but that's the basis. Wow, that's beautiful and compelling. So thank you for sharing. Well, that's where I'm at, and I I hope I am able to convince a few people at least that this is a unique and valuable way of understanding humanity. Yeah. Well, sounds like a good thing to end on. So thank you so much for your time, and uh, until next time. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks. Thanks so much for listening. If you like what you hear, click follow or subscribe depending on your platform. Check the notification bell so you're up to date with new episodes and leave us a review. Until next time.